Lecture 11, Virtual Memory, Part 2. So we'd like to continue our discussion of virtual memory by considering a few uh, slightly more advanced considerations um, that we have not yet um, covered, just to wrap up this topic before we're ready to go on to the next major area of the course. So you might remember from a previous course uh, when we talked about inter-process communication, we discussed the idea of memory mapped files. I wouldn't say we covered them in super great detail, uh, and I had a nice little diagram that showed you sort of how does a memory mapped file actually look um, in terms of shuffling the data to and from disk. Um, but now we can have a better understanding of its actual implementation, given what we understand about memory at this point. So let's talk about it. The basic premise is that disk blocks for the file are mapped to memory, and if a chunk of the file is referenced that is not in memory, we treat that as if it is a page fault, and a page size piece of the file is then brought into memory to uh, be available for use. Um, in this regard, it is then expected that other accesses are just memory reads and writes uh, on the data in memory without going to disk. Um, and so to a certain extent, this resembles kind of you know, stuff we've seen already. Um, and it's not that different um, from the idea of just, okay, if you loaded the whole file into memory, um, then you would um, you know, read all the data from disk, you would put it in memory, uh, and some of it would maybe eventually get swapped out depending. This is a little bit more efficient um, it's uh, a little bit nicer than um, doing that because only the elements that we need are actually brought into memory, uh, but also we're treating it just as if it is memory as opposed to worrying about like treating it as if it is something else. Okay, now in the um, single process scenario, we didn't care very much um, about making sure that everything was synchronized um, because it kind of wasn't necessary. Right, um, it, it didn't turn out to be that uh, important as far as we were concerned um, because, well, nobody else needs to know about it, right? Um, and that, I mean, it didn't make it very useful for inter-process communication, did it? Um, right, um, that was the context in which we brought it up, but you can bring up uh, a you know, memory map file if you want, um, just for your own use, because it was more convenient than doing things certain other ways. However, um, the, the real purpose um, that we wanted earlier was the idea of inter-process communication. And for that, um, well, what we would end up with is the virtual memory um, is mapped to two different processes, right? The memory map file appears in two different processes as far as we are concerned. Um, and that is a perfectly good solution, right? Um, however, part of the reason why we needed to explicitly call synchronization um, using the MS sync uh, routine was based around the idea that because it's sort of uh, memory reads and writes are um, fine, but you know, disk reads and writes are sort of on demand, um, we only go and fetch a block for the file if we truly need it. So explicit synchronization was used to make sure um, that uh, everybody gets the same version of the data. So that's kind of what it was uh, what it was about. The other uh, advanced consideration for IO when we think about memory uh, is the idea of well memory mapped IO. Uh, and in memory mapped IO what we are doing is saying well to communicate with a particular hardware device um, all that needs to happen is that we um, designate this area of memory uh, as being the um, mapped to the device memory. Um, and that's okay, right? Um, this is interesting though, right? Um, because it does mean that any, uh, any read or write that we want to do just sort of looks like reading or writing from memory, but in reality it goes out over the bus to the hardware device um, which maybe is not obvious. And part of the reason why this sort of you know, arbitrary address thing is interesting um, is, well, um, when hardware designers do this, they don't know where stuff is gonna get placed in main memory. Um, in fact, if anything, um, main memory locations these days are random because that's a security concern if we knew exactly where it was going to be. 
Um, and so, yeah, in general, we don't know where it's going to be. And yet, we need to write to a distinct memory location, you know, pre-agreed upon location, and have it go out over the bus. Um, so it does take some work on the part of the operating system to make that happen um, for the ordinary reader write to actually be sent out over the bus as opposed to, uh, well, to the hardware device as opposed to um, main memory. Um, however, the idea of memory mapped I.O. is intended to um, simplify I.O. operations, right? And that way communicating with the device works just the same way as communicating with memory uh, and no special operations are needed. This is kind of like um, how in Unix uh, we treat everything as a file that is an abstraction. The purpose of the abstraction is to make it simpler to work with the, um, with the idea of whatever device or whatever thing it is. Is it a socket? Is it a pipe? Um, is it actually a file? Um, and having stuff be sort of memory mapped is intended in the same way um, to make it a lot simpler as far as um, our system is concerned to make sure that we can um, just deal with it in a nice way. This contrasts with the older style port mapped IO um, and in port mapped IO, um, there were different CPU instructions and different registers associated with uh, every single operation. Um, and that didn't always work as well as you might expect, right? Um, it, it made sense in you know, early computers where they were not extensible. We'll talk about the idea of like adding new devices to um, hardware, um, adding new hardware and stuff like that a little bit later on. Um, but in a, in a simple computer where that's not a requirement, where that's not an option, then okay, we can have different hardware instructions for um, everything that we want to do. But uh, that's not super scalable and it's not ideal. Uh, and so, yeah, actually, um, our typical uh, expectation is, how about we just don't do that? Uh, instead of having those you know, separate uh, instructions and registers, we just use the uh, I.O. operations. It does work, it's just more difficult to work with, right? The universal translator is broken, uh, and um, when that happens, you know, how do you translate stuff into arbitrary hardware commands? Okay, um, the first major uh, new consideration is allocation of frames. Um, in a simple system where we're not doing anything fancy, um, if there are n frames in the system, then we just use demand paging for all of them. So the initial state is that all frames are empty and is needed, pages are read into those frames. Once pages have been read into all those frames, so all n are full, uh, page n plus one needs to replace a page that's already in a frame because, well, there's no more space, right? We have to um, take something out of um, the frames to make room for the new thing. And um, when a process terminates, um, we could mark all the frames uh, that it takes up as free. Um, and that's perfectly easy. Um, nothing to do there. We don't have to evict them. They'll just get overwritten because they're marked as free. Uh, and in theory, one process could fill all the frames in the system. You know, evil, all mine, raccoon aside. Um, it, there is a possibility that like one process is, if you will, um, if not monopolizing the resource, then like using an excessive amount of the resource of available frames. So that's the simplest approach where we didn't consider anything fancy. Now let's think about how can we build on that. All right, maybe you have some ideas, but I'll suggest at least kind of a, a first one, um, which is make a reservation. Uh, and we might reserve a few pages to be free at all times for performance reasons. Uh, as, uh, as Jerry Seinfeld says, you know how to take a reservation, you just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's kind of the important part. Uh, and if you don't recognize this, this is from the show Seinfeld. This is some OK Boomer stuff. Um, even I didn't really watch Seinfeld. Uh, some of my parents liked. Um, but yeah, moving on. The idea of my, uh, behind the reservation, right, is this idea that when we need to move something into a frame, if there are currently no frames available, we're going to have to evict something. We're going to have to choose what we're going to kick out uh, and potentially write that out to disk. Um, depending on whether it's been modified, um, whether we need to uh, or not. So that potentially slows down the read, right? Um, if we have to do a write first, um, we enqueue the write, we wait for the write to complete, then we schedule the read. 
the read takes place and then we have the data. Whereas if we keep at least some frame free, we can always do the read into one of the free frames uh, and then we'll go through the process of deciding what we're going to kick out to restore sort of our, our minimum amount of free frames. And when we do that, the read doesn't have to wait for the write. The write can take place asynchronously you know, at a later time you know, when it's convenient for us to do that. Uh, and that maybe speeds up the performance of the program that wants you know, to access the new page that we've just brought in. Right, um, so read not having to wait for the write does allow the user process to continue sooner than it otherwise would. Um, now, assuming as we did talk about a little bit at least with cache, um, there might be some uh, desire to allocate different numbers of frames to different processes and maybe not necessarily let you know, one very memory intensive process run wild and you know, dominate all of memory. It's a choice. Um, there are going to be you know, pros and cons of each of those things, right? Um, first one is we are constrained in the number of pages um, in actual memory, the number of frames that can actually be allocated to a given um, process. There's kind of no escaping the fact that you know, memory only holds so much, and if memory is full, we can't put anything more. So um, you know, the maximum number of frames a process can have is the maximum number of frames in the system. Uh, alternatively, you know, buy more RAM, um, assuming you know, if you have the kind of computer where you could actually add more RAM, which, as I say, isn't always a given anymore. Now, the minimum number is actually what's interesting here, right? Um, you know, the Why do we care about the minimum? Well, um, the motivation behind a minimum number of frames is ostensibly performance. Um, as long as our page replacement algorithm is sane, so not first in, first out, or not random, um, adding more frames will reduce the page fault rate for the program, and that will improve the performance of said program. Uh, and we haven't talked about scheduling yet, we're about to, uh, but one of the goals of scheduling, as you may imagine, is like some measure of fairness, right? Um, this idea that we don't want you know, a process to never get a chance or you know, to have a, a completely miserable experience um, at, the, you know, at the benefit of another process. So based on that, we might actually choose to you know, allocate a minimum number of frames to uh, each process to make sure that you know, there's at least a baseline level of fairness. But what's the absolute minimum? Um, and the answer is, well, actually, it's determined by the architecture. Um, you know, uh, not as in like house architecture, um, you know, this you know, would definitely, um, as shown here, never pass uh, any kind of safety inspection. This is, quite frankly, horrifying from a safety point of view. I mean, I'm sure it looks cool, um, but um, yeah, so it, you would not want to live there. Okay, but actually, as you know, I actually mean system architecture and not, you know, house architecture. Um, so imagine a machine where a memory reference instruction may contain one memory address. You know, load um, data from here to there, right, like a copy instruction. Um, in the worst case, then, the instruction and the address are on different pages, so the instruction and the um, data that we need uh, require two frames to be able to complete this instruction, right? We're going to move this data into a register, and um, that takes two pages, two frames, because the instruction is in the instructions and the data is you know, allocated somewhere in the heap. Great. Um, if the max frames for this process were one, this instruction could never be completed, right? Um, why could it never be completed? Well, you see, when we load the instruction, we will find out, okay, we have a page fault where we need to. Um, uh, we need to fetch the data and we put it in memory, but because this process is allowed only one page in memory at a time, we replace the page with the instruction. So when we try to restart the instruction and do it again, we have a page fault. So we go and fetch the instruction and it replaces the page where the data was and, and you can see why this wasn't, um, this wasn't going to work. Um, and uh, different architectures have different things. I mean, this is ancient history for sure, but like the uh, IBM 370 had an MVC instruction, which moves data from one storage location to another. Um, and the instruction itself is six bytes. Um, and it's possible that the instruction straddles a page boundary just because of you know, <laughs> good or bad luck. 
depending on how you want to think about it. Um, and so it could potentially require six frames um, for the source and the destination if they also straddle page boundaries. Um, and there's also um, in the architecture an execute instruction and the execute instruction is a way of saying like go here and do something um, and if the execute instruction is also straddling a page boundary it requires two more so eight frames potentially are needed is that super likely no um, but it just gives you an idea that the uh, actual architecture is the determining factor for what is the minimum number of frames that a process can get away with uh, if it's going to successfully execute all of its instructions. Um, and uh, the problem could be actually infinitely bad if the architecture allows referencing of an indirect address. Um, the address uh, being referenced could be on another page um, and that instruction itself could then reference another indirect address and you, know, you can see how it's um, recursive at this point. Um, turtles all the way down as, as the saying goes. Um, that it, it, we could have an infinite chain basically of indirect references uh, or at least if not an infinite one then an arbitrary length chain uh, and an arbitrary length chain is a problem because then we need an arbitrary length number of pages to fill it all in um, and as you can imagine um, things could get uh, could get a little painful uh, don't know if I've come to bargain you know, feeling like we've been here before because we have Okay, um, so in that case, right, the entire virtual memory has to be in main memory, um, which is generally speaking not possible. Um, so we have to bargain. And the standard solution is to limit the levels of indirection to some value. Um, if you can only have a chain that is you know, 16 levels of indirection long, um, then the worst case scenario is a requirement of 17 pages. It's not a ridiculous amount. You know, how, how many levels of indirection do you actually need? This is a, a matter of taste. As long as you pick something and stick to it, we can actually answer the question of how many, um, how many frames, uh, how many pages need to be in those frames uh, to execute an arbitrary program given our architecture. Right. Um, rather like recursion leading to a stack overflow, um, it's possible that you know, it prevents a program from running. Um, but if it's in an infinite loop, we just terminate it. Okay. Now, assuming we don't just allocate every process the minimum or the maximum number of frames, right? There are some allocation algorithms that we could follow. Um, we already kind of got a glimpse at this when we talked about, say, local local versus global cache replacement. Um, and if there are m frames in the system and the operating system reserves k of them for its own use, uh, which is to say for the kernel, but also for things like having free pages, uh, as we discussed um, a little bit earlier on, um, then there are m minus k frames available for processes. So option one is equal allocation. If there are n processes, then uh, we say each process gets m minus k divided by n frames. Uh, and if the division produces a remainder, use those leftover frames as the pool of free frames for performance purposes, as we've discussed. Um, so it sounds very fair. You know, everybody gets one slice of cake and you know one uh, bottle of uh, bottle of pop. But is it is it optimal? I mean, I don't know, right? Um, why does a text editing program get the same amount of frames as the web browser? Um, you know, Notepad and Chrome have vastly different memory needs. Um, and why do they all get the same amount as a game, which tends to be very demanding on, on memory, right? You, know, you want to play on a Cyberpunk 2077 or something, you're not going to get away with just a uh, text editor amount of frames to make that work. Next idea. Proportional allocation, which is um, each process should get a share of the frames according to its needs. So let the uh, virtual memory size of a process P sub I be defined as S sub I and therefore capital S is the sum of all of those um, virtual memory sizes. If the total number of frames is M and the operating system has K, um, we allocate A sub I frames to a process uh, based on the formula below, a sub i is equal to s sub i divided by s times m minus k. Um, that is to say the number of allocated frames is basically the percentage of the total memory demands that the current process wants multiplied by the number of frames available. 
So if this process, uh, its total wishes are 60% you know, of the memory, then it can get 60% of the frames. Now listen, the um, value of, of AI is only an estimate. Um, things may not divide evenly, um, which is obviously going to be a problem. Um, so rounding is required, uh, and minimums need to be enforced as well, based, as we've discussed uh, just a minute ago, on the architecture of the system. Um, and so to make that work, um, the sum of all the values cannot exceed the you know, total available frames. Um, so some of the larger processes will tend to have their allocations nudged down to make sure that smaller processes are brought up to the minimum. Um, and uh, typically we're going to round up in some of those scenarios as well. Uh, so if it's a large process, and you know, although in, in principle it might be entitled to, let's say, 57% you know, of uh, the available frames, uh, we might nudge it down so it's only like 56.8% you know, of available frames because we needed to uh, hand over a few to make sure that smaller processes have the minimum. Thing is um, that with proportional allocation, uh, as with equal allocation, there's no regard given to the priorities of the processes. Uh, and one of the ways that we could actually give priority to a process is to help it to execute faster. And the, the way that we would help it execute faster would be by giving it more frames, right? That would reduce its number of page faults and accordingly reduce the amount of time it spent waiting for data to be brought in to memory. Uh, and all of that sounds like it runs faster, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, we haven't really talked a lot about priority. Um, and I keep, you know, hinting that we're going to talk about um, scheduling and, you know, it's important. And uh, you might even be thinking that it was actually like poor scheduling to put scheduling this far at the end of the course. Um, but, yeah, um, this is how things are. Um, so priority matters a lot in scheduling. We will definitely be um, visiting that topic for an extended period soon. But let's just finish what we're doing with the virtual memory topic first. Hmm? Okay, um, and think global, act local. Um, I, know, I don't know, things raining down from the North Pole. I have questions. Um, we've already discussed the idea of local and global replacement when we talked about caching, but you can have kind of a similar idea um, in main memory. Uh, so if we chose the uh, least recently used algorithm in a global replacement policy, it's the least recently used page anywhere in memory that's replaced. Uh, if we chose the local policy, it's the least recently used page that belongs to the current process. Um, local is not really affected very much by our allocation concerns. Um, so if we've said, all right, you get a fixed number of uh, frames, uh, or at least you know, a uh, specified number of frames, well then local replacement doesn't change very much because we just move things around um, as we need inside those allocated frames. But if we choose global allocation, then we'll see that there's a bit more of a dynamic aspect to it, right? The number of um, frames allocated to each process will change over time. Uh, and over time, global replacement algorithm means processes that run more often will accumulate more pages in memory because when they're running, they are taking pages um, from you know, somewhere, whether they were free or from somewhere else. Um, and so it is very likely in this scenario that they end up taking more than are taken from them, meaning these processes end up with more stuff in memory overall. With that said, um, it probably makes sense from the point of view of the operating system to keep an eye on things, right? Watch how many frames a process has. Um, it may be desirable to prevent a particular process from falling below a minimum threshold. Um, and your minimum threshold doesn't have to be the absolute minimum as specified by the architecture, but it might just be like, okay, be below this point, there would be so many page faults, it would actually be incredibly frustrating. Um, so maybe it's for the best if we just swap that process out. Uh, swap completely to disk, a process that no longer meets the threshold. It's just not important enough right now. Let's leave it be and we will come back to it uh, another time. Speaking of things to come back uh, uh, to another time, I've mentioned already the idea of thrashing. Uh, and now it's time actually to return to that subject and make sure that you know, we uh, don't leave it, uh, leave it forgotten. So uh, in the introduction to virtual memory, I mentioned it um, and the quick definition still applies, right? Uh, the operating system is spending so much time um, moving stuff 
into and out of memory that no useful work gets done. Aside from intentionally depriving the system of RAM, how do we get into this state? But perhaps more importantly, how do we get out of it? Okay, so let's consider a very simple example um, involving, uh, shall we say, ancient operating systems. Um, and in those ancient operating systems, you couldn't run everything all at the same time. It just didn't work very well. Uh, and so uh, the operating system had built into it some logic that controlled how many processes could run at a time. And it would look at the CPU utilization and only the CPU utilization. If utilization is low, it means the CPU needs more work to do, which is to say start something or you know, swap something into memory, um, get it get it going again, you know, unsuspend a process. Okay, um, global page replacement is used in this situation. Um, so you know, when a process gets a page fault, it just takes a frame from another process. And under most circumstances, this works just fine. Um, right, when we, um, when we start new things, we're giving the CPU more work to do. And if in fact it is because the CPU is bored, well, then great, problem solved. The situation, however, um, can run until one process ends up getting a lot of page faults, like in a short period of time. And this is not unreasonable, right? If we think about how a typical um, program works, it could do the same thing all the time, or it could have uh, different stages, right? The compiler is actually a really nice example of something that has like different stages, it has different phases uh, to transform your code from you know, what you typed in in human readable language to you know, the binary executable, right? There's reading the files and there's parsing it and then there's um, uh, analyzing it and there's generation of binary code. Uh, and those things are all different stages of the process and they require like different functionality. And so like, if the compiler has um, finished reading and parsing the input files, it's now going to you know, do the analysis and the generation of binary code. That requires a whole bunch of new instruction pages Right? because we're now doing completely different functionality um, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, output space. Right? You know, we're, here's where we're gonna put the uh, uh, results of the uh, intermediate stages before we end up putting it all out to the binary file on disk. Um, and so this is an opportunity to examine a situation where yeah, we actually you know, changed what the program is doing pretty radically. Um, and when the process uh, moves from one phase to another, right, it's going to have page faults and those page faults result in taking pages from another process. Um, and so this can happen if we've ended up loading in a lot of pages into those frames for the compiler that, well, the other processes, the ones that just lost pages uh, in frames to, um, to the compiler, well, they needed those. Right? So when they get a turn to run, they are also going to generate a bunch of page faults because they needed whatever page was um, swapped out to continue executing. And so when this happens, we end up with sort of more and more requests that are queued for memory reads and writes um, because we have all these pages that are uh, needed and we have all these I.O. requests that are outstanding uh, so that we can continue working. But the fatal mistake is that the system, seeing that the CPU is not very busy because virtually all the processes are blocked for I.O., decides that we should schedule more programs to run. That makes it worse. A new process getting started it leads, uh, needs at least the minimum number of pages. Those have to come from somewhere, so they will necessarily come from you know, frames that are currently belonging to other processes, and this causes, causes more page faults more time spent paging, lower CPU utilization, and that triggers the operating system to start more processes. No work is getting done now because, well, the operating system is spending all of its time moving pages into and out of memory, and this is thrashing, right? Uh, and this little diagram, I mean, it's cute, um, and you know, conveniently there are no numbers uh, associated with it um, because, you know, that would be too easy, but it's just sort of to give you an idea of the uh, progression of the curve, right? Like starting more processes does increase CPU utilization up to a point, um, but at some point uh, it results in thrashing because we are just moving stuff in and out of memory all the time. Um, so we're not actually uh, we're not actually getting useful work done. Right? The bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Okay, 
So what do we do if we suspect that thrashing is occurring? Yeah, we have to do the opposite. We have to actually um, decrease the number of processes that are in memory at a given time, right? Uh, if the problem is we're spending too much time switching between the various processes, the best thing that we can do in this situation is have fewer processes to switch between. Is it you know, magic? Is it perfect? Um, it's not always going to be an instant cure, but it is helpful. The other thing, of course, is recognizing that CPU usage alone is not a sufficient indicator as to whether more or few processes need to be running right now. If CPU utilization is low, it matters why. And looking into why and making a good decision is much more important than just saying, oh, well, this one indicator you know, is down, so we better do something about it. Another reason that causes low CPU usage, for example, is deadlock. Right? Um, it doesn't mean that you know, there aren't enough programs. It means we have a different kind of problem and we need to take action to solve that if we are going to solve it, um, as opposed to just starting more things which may themselves just get snared in the deadlock. Um, so it's not, not always uh, so straightforward. So what if we stop uh, using the global replacement and instead use local? Would that prevent us from getting into thrashing. It limits some of the damage, right? If process P1 is thrashing and you know it's been it's not really executing very much because we're doing so much work to load pages in and out of memory, well it can't steal pages from P2, so we don't get a cascade. Process P1 is unhappy, you know, they're having a bad time, um, but other processes are able to continue as per usual. Um, but Nevertheless, um, process P2 is still affected at least a little bit. Uh, if P1 is spending a lot of time paging to and from disk, any other process that wants to use the disk is going to have to spend more time waiting because the queue is longer. So there's very you know, small but noticeable effects uh, on other processes. It's not... Um, it's not as though you can just completely avoid this <laughs> altogether and say, yep, um, that's process P1's problem, right? If, uh, if they're having a bad time, everybody's having a bad time to at least a small degree. So um, we could decide whether we need to start or suspend programs um, based not just on CPU usage, but on the number of page faults that occur in a given period of time. Uh, and that's just kind of a good indication uh, that maybe we have too much going on. Right, and this is probably relatable, right? Um, if you are trying to do too many things at the same time, you know, you're trying to do some work and you know, listen to music and uh, somebody's talking in the next room and all these things and, and you feel like you're sort of constantly switching between all the things that are going on and you never get to concentrate on anything, that's a hint, right? There's, there's too many context switches, there's too many page faults, if you will. Uh, that mean a lot of time is being lost in that regard. Uh, and maybe on co-op you've um, you know, discussed with I don't know, uh, employers or supervisors or others about this, um, this idea that one of the things that um, managers try to do is like, try to minimize the uh, number of context switches that you know, employees have to do uh, because context switches are costly, right? There, there is effort required to switch between tasks and you know, put one thing down and pick up the next thing. Uh, and so they try to minimize it, right? And in my own experience, you know, as a manager, I try to like schedule all the meetings to be next to each other. So you don't end up um, you know, getting into some work and then, oh no, I have to stop what I'm doing and attend a stupid meeting and then try to get back into the work afterwards. Like it's, it's just difficult. So um, yeah, if there are too many page faults, um, it indicates we have too much going on. But that's reactive, right? Um, if we're looking and counting the number of page faults, we might say, okay, if the page fault rate is elevated you know, at this uh, rate um, for this period of time, that's an indication that something is wrong and we should do something about it. But it's reactive. For how long have we been suffering this situation versus um, you know, could we be proactive? Could we deal with it before thrashing has started? All right, well, you know, tell me the future then. Hmm? Uh, it's not that easy to you know, identify when thrashing would start, um, but you know, the part of the problem is we don't know um, in advance how many pages a process is going to need and when they're going to need them. 
Um, and so you can't really ask. There's no way to um, you know ask for this information or you know get a, sort of a reliable answer um, from you know, some third party source. Um, so we're going to have to rely on educated guessing. And you might um, you might hate that, right? Uh, let's experiment and find out is good, um, but it's not uh, always uh, not always a solution. Um, I, I hope uh, medical uh, experiments are not done on the basis of I don't know. Let's try it out and see what happens. Um, similarly, um, I don't think NASA like plays around with satellites in orbit like it's a simulation. Uh, just because uh, those things are very expensive and uh, you can't just you know, send up a replacement if you need. Um, but for software, usually we can you know, just make a simulation or we can uh, just make our best guess. Uh, and if we're right, we're right. If we're wrong, we're wrong. Hopefully you know, this isn't a life or death scenario. So what do we know about process memory accesses? So we said that they tend to obey the principle of locality, both temporal and spatial. And I presented to you an argument that said like, okay, imagine you're uh, iterating over an array. We have uh, a summation, so we have a sum variable and we have a, um, an array that contains some number of elements. Um, and I said, this hopefully you know, gives you a good understanding of the idea of both temporal and spatial locality. But I didn't really prove that it's true, did I? Right? Um, we can think of like different parts of the program as different localities, as if they were areas on a map. Localities can overlap sometimes. Um, and if we're correct, um, then giving a process enough frames for its locality means that it can operate in its area without encountering too many page faults. Not to say there won't be any. Uh, things uh, will not always be perfect, um, but we have sort of enough for the moment. Okay, now the question that I ask is, does the principle of locality actually hold? We don't have to verify that for ourselves. Um, there is uh, a reference here um, which recognizes, okay, here's a graph showing the um, locality of memory accesses. Uh, and so uh, here's execution time going from left to right along the bottom. This is a rather sort of ancient, uh, uh, ancient paper, but it is nevertheless still valid. Um, but it shows the locality of memory accesses and there's page numbers and each little dot represents a, a hit. Um, where we you know, referenced something or read or write uh, in those pages. Okay, what's our takeaway from this graph? Is uh, temporal locality, is spatial locality real? I'm going to argue yes. Um, we can see over time you know, the patterns that have emerged. Um, if our assumptions did not hold at all, this graph would look like white noise, right? If accesses were completely random, uh, there was no way to predict when uh, or where a future uh, memory access was going to take place. This graph would would just look like nothing, right? You know, <laughs> look, you know look at the static on the screen. You know. <laughs> oh, did you take a picture of snow, right? Because it would just be random noise. We wouldn't have anything to work off of. So, takeaway from this, hopefully, is that yes, locality is real. So. Given that locality is real, um, let's move on and let's focus on actually making use of it then. So the potential solution, uh, as we've kind of touched on a little bit, is this idea of a working set model. Um, and we're going to say that the last n pages in memory represent the locale of the program, so to speak. Uh, and assuming that most memory accesses are local, and we have a good reason to believe this is the case, um, then the most recent n pages will be the ones that are used most frequently, at least in the immediate future. Um, in textbook descriptions, the uh, n in this case that represents this um, locale uh, is frequently referred to as delta, the working set window. Uh, and pages that have been recently used are in the working set. Uh, if a page has not been accessed recently, it will you know, drop out of the working set uh, after delta time units since its last reference. So suppose the window is defined as being 10 accesses. Uh, any page that was accessed in the last 10 requests is considered part of the working set. Um, if the next um, 10 memory accesses are all in page K, then after those further accesses, the working set contains only page K. Um, 
if pages um, not been used recently, we expect it to drop out. Uh, and so based on this, the size of the working set will change. It can be anything from one page up to you know, maximum of delta. Uh, it's really just a question of what is the program doing. Um, if delta is set to be too small, the working set does not encompass the entire locale. Uh, so we end up going outside this pretty frequently. Um, if it's too large, it covers multiple locales. There's too much stuff in there. We're maintaining things that we do not need. Um, so underestimating the size is bad because it means there's more page faults, but overestimating isn't any better uh, because it potentially means that we are expecting too many processes to be running uh, and we might restrict the ability of processes to run um, based on that. If the working set of every process is summed up, we would get the total number of frames that each process would like, like in quotation marks, to have. Um, and um, if the sum exceeds the sort of m minus k available frames available in the system, at least one process is going to be unhappy. That is to say, it doesn't have as many frames as it needs. Uh, and you know, like unhappy workers who go on strike, uh, unhappy processes start thrashing, right? They, they want to run, but they don't have enough uh, resources and they do not behave in the way that we were expecting. So hmm, what do we do? Um, once a value of delta is determined, the operating system can monitor the working set of each process and use that to figure out if the system is currently overloaded. Uh, if that's the case, there's too much demand and not enough frames available to meet it, well then the operating system can choose to well suspend a selected process uh, and then you know, that will prevent thrashing. Uh, if the system is underloaded, that is to say there are um, not as many requests for frames as there are available frames, then, well, we could start something else, right? This would work. Um, the page fault rate does tend to vary over time um, with a particular process. Um, at the beginning, there's a bunch of page faults while a particular process gets started up, um, and then it's established, if you will, in its first locale. Once that happens, the number of page faults will drop uh, until it moves to the new uh, next place, uh, and then you know, the process begins again, so to speak. This is like uh, with the compiler, if uh, the first step of this, uh, of the compilation process is you know, reading and parsing, there'll be a bunch of page faults associated with that. Uh, and then the reading and parsing can take place uh, without quite so many page faults until we're ready to go on to say analysis. Uh, and then at that point, um, the number of page faults increases again uh, and it will eventually settle down uh, before we go on to the next part. Uh, the next part is code generation. And again, there'll be a bunch of page faults associated with that when we get started. It's you know, pretty, pretty common for a lot of processes to follow that kind of pattern. Um, so what we are expecting, if you will, is for the, you know, the working set to look something like this, right? Um, the, the page fault rate rises uh, temporarily until we're sort of settled in the new locale, and then it drops off. It's not necessarily going to drop to zero because uh, we might still need to reference you know, new things or load data from somewhere. Um, but overall, we do expect it to be a lot lower. Maybe this doesn't really sort of make sense. Let me try to explain with an analogy. Um, let's say that you have moved to a new city for a co-op term, like you've uh, never been to Ottawa before and you know, your next co-op is located there. Um, or should I say California? Sure. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you've never been to um, Cupertino before, uh, so you, you don't know where anything is in, in this place, right? So, um, when you moved, you frequently rely on Google Maps um, or whatever other map program you like, Apple Maps or um, anything, you know, it doesn't matter, until uh, you know what you're looking for, right? So you, know, you wanna find a supermarket, well, you don't know where there is one, so you're gonna have to search for it, right? Um, you, you want to, I don't know, find um, a coffee shop, again, search for it. Um, you, you're looking for a place to find I don't know, Italian food, again, you search for it. Um, so you ask Google, right? Um, and once you've been there, you've sort of established a certain level of familiarity with the place, right? Um, once you know the way to the grocery store, it is part of your working set, um, and you don't have to ask Google again. I mean, you can, 
Um, but when you go places you know, frequently enough, you've sort of learned where they are, you remember how to get there, um, you don't have to check into it every single time, right? And you do the same thing at university. Um, when you, know, you came to university, you probably didn't know off the cuff where any of the buildings were. Um, but uh, okay, now I know uh, where's E5, uh, where's STC, uh, where's E7, um, where's um, PAC. Like all those things you, you learn and you add them to your working set. And when they're in your working set, you don't have to look it up every single time. Um, and so this is, this is fairly convenient, right? Um, and you don't have to ask again. Now, um, I'm making the analogy here that say not knowing where the grocery store is, is like page faults. Um, asking Google is like asking the operating system to bring that page in from disk. Uh, once it's done so, it stays in your working set and you don't have to ask again. Uh, assuming you remember where it is, um, which most likely you do, but you, know, uh, you might have to ask more than once. You know, we've all been there. Now, um, this works until your next co-op term. You know, if your next co-op term is a different place and you go to Seattle, uh, again, you're going to have to relearn, if you will, uh, everything and where it all is um, by, once again, asking Google to fill in the information for you because you, know, you don't know where you know, the supermarket is. You don't know where the coffee shop is. You don't know. Uh, how to get to the office. All of those things are um, new. The The way that this analogy sort of falls down, right, is that like after your co-op term in California, you come back to Waterloo and you haven't completely forgotten everything you know about Waterloo. I mean, I, I hope you haven't. I mean, maybe you have, but presumably you haven't. Um, so uh, you uh, don't have quite the same situation as you know, the... Uh, as a program where you know, all of the pages from Waterloo were swapped out uh, and you would have to swap them all in again. Like, you, know, you, you still remember uh, where, where to go get uh, food to eat when you come back to Waterloo. Some places have probably changed you know, when you've been away for uh, any meaningful period of time, um, but not enough so that like everything you know about it is useless, right? And for the computer, when you, know, you swapped out by going to a different locale, you've forgotten everything you know in main memory. Um, so it's not quite as dramatic um, for for us as it is for the CPU. Okay, um, that will conclude our discussion on main memory and virtual memory and uh, how the operating system is responsible for managing it and various management schemes associated therewith. Uh, our next topic, finally, is the one about scheduling. And I've been referencing it uh, off and on basically the whole time so now we're we're finally ready to uh, get into it so let's do it